I'm a philosopher. I work at the Center of Alcohol and Drug Research in Copenhagen. And uh, I'm here to report not uh, a trial. I'm here to report the trial and go to opening up of heroin prescription in Denmark. Yeah. I dare say and take a stand here today after 15, oops, after 15 years in the field, you know that you have to be aware of setbacks, you know we have to be aware of politicization. You just showed an example of how uh, one article in the newspaper could uh, set off something that you've worked out. Well, nevertheless, I, I dare say that we have a lock in Denmark now. Uh, you can't go wrong, and I'll tell you why. There are eight parties in the Danish parliament, and we've been close to a majority for following the example of the Dutch, the Swiss, the English, the, the Germans before, but now we don't have a majority. That would be an understatement. We have a complete turnaround. All eight parties in the Danish parliament support our own description. And uh, that's quite a, 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 a astounding situation. We had a, an election recently. That could have changed a lot. It didn't. The new health minister came in and made a clear commitment to go forward. And the health board also made recommendations to go forward. Not least, uh, we have funding in place, something like $10 million for the next three years. Uh, which was also one of the prerogatives of, of being sure this is going to happen. So, I at least lack the imagination of how this would go wrong. From 2008 and onwards, we will prescribe heroin in Denmark, following the examples of some countries. Now, I'd like to try to answer four questions. What would be novel about the English heroin prescription? What was different in the road leading up to it? What facilitated the policy breakthrough? And are there any lessons to be learned from that? I think others might be interested in this. Well, some things will be novel. Every heroin trial so far has come up with a research protocol of what was supposed to be scientifically investigated. Now, some of that has been politics. It's been a, a way of opening up for something that one thought was sensible already. <laughs> when the Swiss started, it was perfectly uh, reasonable to make a trial because the feasibility wasn't proven anywhere and uh, showing that, that addicts actually benefited was still up for, open for discussion. Then the evidence has started, started to come in and uh, what, what we are ending up with after the first three trials the Dutch and the German as well, is that it becomes more and more redundant to conduct more trials. The evidence is in. Not, mu not much will come out of the trials. They're expensive. They're slow. The data, there is no need for, for, for some of it at least. And uh, in Denmark, we made the conclusion that a small country with of just five million hardly has the, what's needed to do a, a, a trial, we would have perhaps made the worst trial in the world. <laughs> we don't have professors that can really carry this through, and a lot of other reasons. So, and, and there's another thing as well. When, when the, the evidence is in, you have to question whether it's really ethical to make one more proof of addicted people into human error trial guinea pigs. Uh, for what reason? I mean, most people are against unnecessary animal testing. Why not approve of unnecessary human testing? So, basically, the, the political move has been quite bold and, and novel. We are not doing a hair trial. We will go straight for hair prescription as a treatment option. That's novel. Now, the devilish details haven't been settled yet. It looks very much like we'll be introducing a hybrid of the classical British system. We'll be administratively reclassifying heroin, like the Dutch have done, to re-enter it into the pharmacopoeia. 
we appoint a number of specialists who will author, be authorized to prescribe. Some sort of clinical protocol will be set up to make sure that the needed adjustments can be made along the way. Uh, we will likely admit a number of approximately three to 500 who have not benefited, just like we does today. That's for the target group who have not benefited from other treatment modalities. And then we will learn and adjust along the way. Now, what was different leading up to that situation? It was quite different than what has led up to the experiment in Switzerland and in Germany and, and, and Holland. Now, there was a recognition, of course, that we had to deal with nuisance problems and that there were health and social problems of the addicted that had to be addressed in new ways. But we didn't take the route of opening up injection facilities. For instance. That has been effectively blocked by the status quo, the Harlem drug lobbies, and, and so we, we sort of circumvented that. Uh, we haven't had support from the police. The police in Denmark are very, very conservative. They have not voiced any uh, concern on this. We haven't had support of local governments who said, we want this, we have a local problem, Let, let's uh, go forward. We even didn't have support from influential members of the medical establishment. Uh, very few have, have been uh, active in, in this matter. We had a great amount of advocacy on it, and we have had a lot of debates. So I think in that way you have to understand the road to the change in policy has been very different. Now, what facilitated the policy breakthrough? How did change come around? First of all, you have to realize, though it happens now, it didn't happen overnight. It's been a long, long haul, starting 15 years ago. Uh, a multitude of questions have been debated over and over. Misconceptions have been put straight. Myths debunked. Arguments have been countered over and over. In, 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 in Finn language, uh, endurance is called Sisu. And you really have had to have Sisu to put up with all the things that have been said against the trial. But no single factor can explain this, uh, not even uh, Sisu. There's a whole list of factors influencing uh, the Danish current debate, which I'd like to introduce you to. Now, one thing for sure has been the foreign trials. If it hadn't been for the, the foreign trials, we wouldn't have had these discussions. Every time there's been a foreign trial, it's been a policy opening uh, event. We've been following it, and we, we've been basically discussing whether we should do that or not. In German, it's called so in English, and we are hard. Uh, it's like keeping up with the Joneses. Let's have one of those as well. It doesn't go very deep, but it's, it's, it's the basic thing that has happened every time there were new results. It also happened when there were reports from, from John Marx uh, of Mercy Side in, in, in Liverpool area. We, we had discussions by like that. So that has been essential. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, so I'll just go to the next factor. Evidence. Now, evidence for sure has been important, but you can't expect politicians and uh, journalists to read scientific reports. So, in different ways, we've been facilitating the understanding of these scientific reports. Lately, Nana and Gotherson, who sits right there, made a 30 page brief on heroin which was widely distributed. It, 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 it describes what heroin prescription is about, it debunked yet another lot of myths and introduced the evidence of the trials to non-specialists. And I think that document was quite helpful. Uh, another thing we could say about evidence is that the continuous, continuing arrival of evidence has been fruitful in a, in a way that it wouldn't, wasn't the evidence as such that changed the minds of whoever changed their minds, but the continuing arrival gave opportunities to sort of hook into the evidence and say, well, this new evidence convinced me. Because that, that has actually been what happens. I think generally, facts and evidence are marshaled to support the standard of what we're taking. 
And if that's the case, it won't really convince you as such, but the arrival of new evidence will sort of give you an occasion to switch over if you've matured out of your former position and into a new one. And that has happened every time there was a new evidence arrival. Now, another thing which has influenced it is something I call drug tourism of the second order, that is. I mean, we've always talked about drug tourism as going somewhere to take drugs. You should know how many Danish delegations that have gone to visit the uh, different drug trials. We are uh, traveling happy people, and <laughs> even small municipalities have sent off delegations to study this. They didn't have a reason to do it, they just wanted to learn. And the hospitality of the different trials, which has, must have been very burdening, has been such that people, when they see, they believe, they start to understand, that has been facilitating. So drug tourism of the second order has been one of the factors that have influenced it. It has taken time, but more and more people understand what it's about. Another factor is experiencing the misery of open drug scenes directly, not through the media. Yesterday, some of you witnessed how this is done. It was in the question and answer period with Dr. Antonio Maria Costa, Executive Director of UN Offices of Drugs and Crime. Now, Costa recently acclaimed Sweden to be the world champion of drug policy. What happened in that session was that Nana, to contest this, instead of putting up a lot of facts or whatever, just invited Mr. Costa to come join her and see Copenhagen for himself. He would have seen that numerous drug-using Swedes have fled Sweden and that the so-called world championship of Sweden is quite dubitable because these Swedes come to Denmark and go on the streets of Denmark or get treatment in Denmark, treatment they can't get in Sweden. Now, I don't think that Mr. Costa is going to visit the open drug schemes in Copenhagen, but this tactic of invitation that has worked well with a number of key politicians in Denmark, it's very different seeing the misery, real life, and seeing it safely at a distance. And it's hard, once you are there, not to start wondering whether the people you see could not perhaps be helped somehow with new approaches since the old obviously haven't helped. Now, the first majority situation in Danish politics was actually established when the leader of the utmost right-wing party paid a long visit to a shelter for drug-using sex workers. She swung over after that experience. That's what moved her, not the evidence. And like others before her that have been invited out of their offices, that reality changed what they think about hearing prescription. Another thing I like, another factor, is learning how to talk and talk. Now, yesterday, Ethan mentioned the importance of teaching and also of being able to talk the talk and walk the walk. Well, I'd like to give you two examples of, of talking the talk, which are interestingly not about money or resources. A number of years ago, a leading politician was considering whether to back heroin prescription. He was ready to shift his position, but then he starts thinking and comes up with a shocker. It's really not very clever. He says, oh, <coughs> drug dealing it, it doesn't have a pyramidal structure. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, you could say so. Yeah. And you have big dealers at the top, the middlemen and the street dealers, and the actors at the bottom, right? Well, yeah, yeah, you could say so. Then he comes up with this point. Well, I'm worried that if we move addicts into a heron trial, we create empty slots in the pyramid, and these will just be filled up by others. Now, this is just one of thousands of, of homegrown uh, arguments, but how do you deal with it? How do you walk the walk? Uh, lecturing how the pyramid will ultimately fall if you just get all the addicts into heroin treatment would not do the trick because he thinks that would just make more slots. Right? The more you move, the more will come in, so that wouldn't work. Uh, 
If you want to make him understand that the market isn't really supply driven, that wouldn't work either because he thinks it is supply driven. And the pushes are the ones making more uh, customers. But there is enough down argument, and, and you know, being with other people uh, that think as well will uh, make you stronger. And uh, the not down, down argument is guess is the power from his own convictions. That's the walking walk. You ask him whether or not he makes he favors making addicts clean, and by offering drug-free treatment, he will of course answer yes. Then comes the kill. You then ask him whether the newly drug-free would not create empty slots in the bottom of the pyramid. <laughs> and he just gets about with this whole pyramid thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, something similar happened recently. A lot of, of the Presley supporters of heroin prescription don't understand very much about it. And what they really want not to do is, like you said, Peter, we don't want to give up on people. We don't want to have them stationed on drugs for the rest of their lives. And they see prescription basically doing that. <coughs> now, it was very fortunate to be able to document that some people actually get off drugs after having been prescribed heroin. Now, the numbers are big, but that doesn't really matter. It made a difference in the world for these people who want to cure addicts out of their habits. The mention of the possibility of abstinence was a, it, it shouldn't have been that much of a sales point, sales point, but presenting it walk the walk. Another thing is, another factor is that there has been documentation of voter support for this. There has been an amazing discrepancy between what voters thought and what politicians there do. Now, there has been a number of polls in Denmark that documented that 70%, just like in Switzerland, was in favor of the policy change. And that is supported when you're a politician that dare not take the step. You, you know that the voters will not punish you heavily for, for taking that stand. Another factor is that as advocates of, of, of this, you just have to go beyond preaching to the choir boys. Convincing the convinced are not, it's not going to do the trick. And in, in, in this case, what was essential was to get into the conservative press, to get into the, 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 the people who could switch over. And that led into get, getting somehow into contact with the tough on crime, hard on drugs crowd. How do you do that? What happened was that a journalist from one of the most conservative business papers in Denmark took interest in the issue. Again, the work of the I don't know how you do it now. <laughs> this journalist was a particularly valuable player because he had very high credibility. He's a top political reporter. He's not a rookie new uh, reporter. He, 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 he is in parliament. He has total access to, to all politicians and he carries a lot of weight. And he went to the street. He left the, the nice, comfy uh, quarters and went into the street and saw what he saw and came back to question conservative government politicians on this. Now, there's one more point, uh, one more fact that I'd like to tell you about. But I'd just like to sum up now because the, the last one is, stands for itself. It's been a long haul. No quick fixes either, either or, or, or on this. We, the inspiration from the trials in other countries has been in, invaluable. Making evidence accept, accessible has been important. Getting a stream of evidence that could be accepted at, at some point has been important. Drug tourism of the second order has been important. Direct experiencing of the misery industry has been important. Learning to talk the talk has been important. Documenting voter support through coding has been important. And getting beyond convincing the convinced has been important. Now, the ultimate turning point, which happened just a few months ago, was the story of Linda. And I'd like to tell you a little about that. The journalist from Parliament went out and encountered a drug-using woman 
who was a sex worker with a very unusual client that paid very well for special services. This elderly man was a necrophile. He brought Linda into oblivion so that he could have brutish sex with her while she was seemingly dead. Linda had been in and out of treatment over and over and serviced this client to finance her heroin habit. The reports in this conservative business newspaper was just too much for respectable, social, humanistic, welfare conservatives. The story of Linda broke down the last persistence. Actually, the story of Linda was the only enclosure to the proposal in Parliament to change policy as well. It's great. Remarkable. Now, you have to give it a think. What happened there? I think ordinary middle class things find it <coughs> difficult to empathize with chaotic drug users. It has to do with the drugs. They're different, right? We don't use that. It has to do with the injection. We don't do that. It has to do with street life. It's just so much different than what ordinary people can empathize with. They're not one of us, these people. They're outside the circle. Sex works on, on top of that makes it even more unlikely than Mr. and Mrs. Jones will empathize with them. Then answer the necrophile. Having sex with someone who's dropped into seemingly being dead constitutes a monster more hideous than drugs and prostitution. He's sick. He's truly perverted. He could do that to anyone if only he had his way, right? We've got to protect the lives of Linda from the lives of this necrophile. What happened is that Linda suddenly gets inside the circle of empathy. The monster makes her one of us and if Linda needs heroin, then we provide her <coughs> heroin. Now, if this is true, a sad story about a necrophile and his abuse of the drug-using woman has contributed substantially to improving the health and well-being of the many who will hopefully benefit from prescription of heroin in Denmark from some time next year. Now, you be the judge of whether something is rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> but I think there's also something else to think about, and that is whether framing and imagery that, that came up in this Linda story should perhaps play a greater part in advocacy. Thank you. Thank you.